Hi guys, Nick here from Conservation Careers and welcome to the podcast. Now as conservationists, one thing we've seen a lot of in the news in recent years is forest fires. Huge blazes across Australia, California and the Amazon raising forests to the ground and decimating wildlife unlucky enough to be in its path. Now today we're speaking with someone who works on the front line as an expert on fires and forest ecology within California. Dr. Hugh Safford is regional ecologist for the US Forest Service, Pacific Northwest region, and also the research faculty at the University of California, Davis. Hugh manages a staff of ecologists that provide expertise in vegetation and fire ecology across 18 national forests in California, and is also the director of the Sierra Nevada region of the California Fire Science Consortium. Now, in this episode, we talk about forest fires within California and how they used to be much more common in the past. We also discuss how our historical management of forests has caused many of the issues we're experiencing today. Hugh finally shares his career insights and advice for people like you who might be seeking to work in the US Forest Service or following similar paths. It's a wide ranging, thoughtful and inspiring interview. As always, enjoy. My name is Hugh Safford. I'm the regional ecologist for the U.S. Forest Service in the Pacific Southwest region, which uh, in the Forest Service constitutes California, Hawaii, and the Pacific Territories. And uh, I work in California. My office is in the North Bay Area, just north of San Francisco. All right. And you work on forest, forest ecology in the kind of California area. And so that's been in the news a lot the last few years with huge forest fires and we've seen forest fires elsewhere in australia and i'm thinking of the amazon too it's been a big issue you know hitting the national and international press and something that you're specifically focused on through your role at the u.s um, forest service yeah um i'd really like to kind of talk about that because i know it's a, a big area of your work as well i mean how common are forest fires nowadays and is it something which is changing with regards to climate change are we seeing them more regularly or or not, or is it just uh, something that has been picked up more by the press? Like, you know, can you talk a little bit around that, please? <laughs> yeah, sure. So I think uh, from the standpoint of, you know, my standpoint as an ecologist, my, my, my job is seeking to understand the way that ecosystems function, you know, how, how species interact, how they interact with the physical environment, things like that. And ecological disturbance is a very important part of ecosystems, things like floods and wind storms and, you know, fires and et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. And because they change the way that an ecosystem looks and functions, very often as humans, we feel as if they're, you know, disastrous with a capital D, and they're not necessarily always disastrous, right? Um, so to understand really what's happening with fire in uh, the Western US in particular, you really have to understand the, the fire regimes, the disturbance regimes that characterize the ecosystem before you can start to make pronouncements about whether they're really bad or they're really they're good, right? Or, or, yeah. or ambivalent. And so I think that, for example, if you want to talk about uh, forest fire trends in, in the Amazon basin, I think most of us can, can acknowledge that it's a, it's a, it's a, a negative trend, the kind of thing that we don't want to continue if we can help it, that these are largely forest types in which large and uh, certainly severe fire really hasn't played a major role. Uh, although we're finding more and more that sort of human use of fire in these ecosystems is probably a lot more widespread than we understood, you know, in terms of mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the European contact. But that said, uh, you know, in wet forests in general, uh, another example would be in Central Europe, for example, where, uh, you know, it's raining all the time, as you know very well. <laughs> and yep. um, fire there has never been uh, 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 an important part of ecosystem process really at any level, but it's starting to become that. And, and all of a sudden countries all the way from, you know, Switzerland to Sweden and Norway are having to consider how they manage wildfires because it's becoming dry enough now in the dry season that things catch fire. So I just in that context of that, I want to talk about the Western U.S., which is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. In the Western U.S., uh, across much of the Western U.S., we, we have a pretty well-defined dry season. And that's very pronounced in California where we have a Mediterranean type climate, you know, similar yeah. to what we see in you know, Greece or Italy or Spain. And uh, as a result, we get a, five, you know, a four to six month drought every year. I mean, that's just the way the ecosystem works. However, California really gets 
across a lot of the state, uh, quite a bit of precipitation in the wet season. So it's a perfect setup for uh, a lot of burning, right? You grow a lot of biomass in the wet season and then turn off the spigot upstairs and then four to six months of hot temperatures and, and, and drought equals extremely flammable vegetation by the time you're in high summer. So, all right, so that's a reality that one always has to take into account in a lot of yeah. the Western US. And as I said, particularly in the Mediterranean part of the Mediterranean climate part of the Western US. So, okay, so let's talk about current fire trends. Well, so the first thing to understand is that actually in the Western US, we're burning much less territory in an average year than was burning before Euro-Americans uh, arrived. Much less, much less. I mean, it's like we're talking in an average year, maybe 10 to 20 percent of what probably burned historically. So uh, what happened was when when European trained foresters uh, arrived on the scene towards the end of the 19th century, they encountered ecosystems they absolutely did not understand. These were ecosystems that were dominated by what we would call pioneer species, even though they were clearly old growth, uh, that had absolutely enormous trees that were uh, very open. Uh, in other words, they weren't, they weren't the kind of places that you'd find elves and trolls and write fairy tales about, <laughs> but rather they were huge open, in some cases, almost savanna-like ecosystems. And the other thing that they recognized was there was fire all everywhere all the time. There were fire scars on trees everywhere. The indigenous peoples were using fire for management. Lightning was igniting fire all the time. And the, the, uh, the forest itself uh, was a product of millennia upon millennia upon millennia of fire acting as the principal um, recycler of biomass and the principal driver of uh, relationships between species. And uh, these individuals, you know, most Euro-Americans had come from Central, Central Europe, Northern Europe at that time who were settling, uh, or at least the people involved in management were, or they were trained at like Yale, which was itself staffed all by Central European, <laughs> you know, foresters or people who'd been trained there. And they didn't understand the system at all. They thought it was a sick forest. And the, the simple solution was, since we were going to be cutting down all the massive trees, was that we just had to stop the fire. Because then we'd get ourselves a nice sort of plantation cycle of cutting the big trees and growing the little trees, et cetera. So anyway, we've been putting fires out for over 100 years, and we passed laws which forbade the uh, Native Americans from using fire, uh, which, which they'd been using for, for millennia as a management tool. And what we have now is a jungle of fuels, right? Because uh, we're in a system where, you know, much of the Western U.S., it's not like the Amazon basin or temperate rainforests along the British Columbia coast where fungus and detritivores and the climate uh, plays a major role in, in recycling biomass after it dies, fire is the main recycler of biomass in much of the Western US. And so when you remove it, you just accumulate biomass. And the same thing is happening in Australia and in some of the other Mediterranean uh, climate uh, places on the planet as well. So anyway, sorry, that was a long preamble, but basically the point is, is that Really, the major issue right now is not that we have too much burning, but that we have too little burning. <laughs> that will seem ironic to a lot of people, but it's the wrong kind of burning that we're getting. And it's, we're, we're having uncontrolled uh, types of burning in now in systems that are holding four to five times more trees than they did historically, in which most of the big trees are gone. Either they were cut a, a long time ago or they're being killed by pests or pathogens or dying due to drought. Mm. Uh, the species that have Dominate, that dominate the forest now, or many of them are not very fire tolerant because they were kept in a bay, or they were kept in abeyance by frequent fire. And as soon as you remove yeah. them, they're better competitors for resources than, for example, a lot of the pine species. And we use the pine species for structural timber. And so we've fu fundamentally changed species composition in a lot of Western forests as well. We've re removed the fire tolerant individuals and replaced them with fire intolerant individuals. Now, often that have tree canopies that go right to the ground. And so they catch fire easily. They torch out very easily. Uh, they turn ground fires into crown fires very easily. So what's happened is the nature of fire has changed. It's not so much that, uh, so the amount of fire actually, again, I just want to, I want to underline it so people get it because a lot of people, will, their jaws will drop. But the issue is that we're burning not nearly, we're not burning nearly enough in an average year. Now you get a year like 2020 where, in California, we burn nearly 2 million hectares of, of mostly forest land in the state. And uh, that was a big year. But if you look at the best estimates that we have out there as to the average 
uh, area that probably burned in California in a year before, you know, major Euro-American settlement after 850, was that 4 million acres is actually a lowball estimate for your average yearly burning. So this is the first year since we've been keeping records that we've come anywhere close to burning the amount of territory that probably did historically in a single year. Uh, and we're freaking out about it. <laughs> so mind you, there weren't 40 million people in the way, you know, in 1650. And there weren't homes built in, in, in highly risky locations. There wasn't the sort of infrastructure that we have now that's, you know, uh, threatened constantly. So it's a very different landscape. The whole landscape matrix has changed. It's full of people now. They're living in really risky places that they had no idea were risky because we've been successfully putting fires out for 100 years. And all of a sudden in the, well, all of a sudden, in the last 30 to 40 years, as the climate's been warming, the drought's been becoming more profound and, and, and humid ignitions are becoming a bigger issue in some parts of the landscape. It's become clear that the situation's it's untenable. And do you see now after these major fires like you saw last year, which historically speaking sound quite average in terms of size and scale, but do you mm -hmm. see forests now recovering back to a more, let's say, natural ecosystem, for want of a better word? Um, or they're reverting back to the sort of ecosystem which has been there for the last hundred years because that's how we've managed it. I mean, is it like a blank canvas which can be restored, or is it now, you know, ingrained in a new a new form? Yeah, it's a great question. So, I mean, uh, again, I'm, I'm I just want to make clear that there are a lot of different ecosystems in the Western U.S. and that fire plays different roles in all of them. So, yeah. what I'm speaking about is what we would call sort of the yellow pine and mixed conifer forest, which is a huge part of the land base, uh, forested land base in the West. My, my statements don't really apply to wet forests along the coast or to, you know, subalpine forests, things like that, where right. fire was much more rare and in which increased fire these days is really is a big issue. Yeah. Um, so uh, what I, I'll say is that the, like I said before, the, the main issue is, is that the nature of fire has changed. And so that when we get a fire, see, when we get a fire these days uh, under, let's call them moderate weather or moderate fuels conditions, where if the fire were allowed to burn, it would probably largely play the kind of ecological role that we'd like it to, we put it out. <laughs> I mean, that's the ironic part, is we put out, you know, 98% of all ignitions now, uh, fires before they get to be, you know, 50 to 100 hectares. So most of the summer isn't catastrophic weather. What happens is that because we've put everything out and the, and the landscape is so filled with fuel now is that when we do get ignitions under catastrophic conditions, we can't stop them, right? And, you know, under really dry, uh, uh, windy conditions, <clears throat> those generally aren't conditions that include lightning in the mix. So you didn't have ignitions in those periods. And, and secondly, Native Americans were smart enough with fire that they knew you, that you didn't go out there playing with, well, they didn't have matches, but you know what I mean? <laughs> they were, they were, metaphorically playing with matches on a really hot, you know, October windy day. But, you know, people these days, they barbecue on whatever day they want. And it's like, oh, look, my barbecue fell over in the wind. Oh, there goes the neighborhood, you know. <laughs> so um, when uh, when fires were burning through these kinds of forests that I'm referring to very, very often. And I mean, I'm talking often, like if you if you cut into a tree that has a, a fire wound that will, you know, a, a scarring from fire in it, you often find that until the late 1800s that these forests were seeing a fire every five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. But it was a very low, fast moving affair through grass and needle litter on the surface. It killed the pines competitors, but it actually mm -hmm. maintained the pines as the dominant species. So today, the big difference is that when we get burning, it tends to be of a very different nature. It's like I said, it's become essentially a jungle of fuels. And so now flames, rather than staying on the ground, find their way into the tree canopy. And Tree, if trees can't conduct photosynthesis, they can't live. And obviously all their photosynthetic surfaces in the canopy. So when you burn through the canopy, you kill trees, uh, particularly con uh, our conifers. We have very few that re-sprout. Hardwoods are a different thing. You know, you're broadly, most of them re-sprout after fire. Mm. So they're what we call pop killers, but, they're, but they respond quickly and they sprout. So they benefit actually from, from uh, periodic disturbance. Um, but the point is, is that with a very, very different fire now, you've created these landscapes in which you've lost huge areas of conifer cover. I mean, there are, there are patches of severe burning where nearly every tree has been killed in these recent forests that are as big as the city of San Francisco. And I mean, uh, when you look at dispersal of conifer seeds, it, 
doesn't go very far. I mean, in some cases, there's there's some animal, um, uh, you know, distribution, uh, yeah, distribution, yeah, dispersal. Sorry, of of seeds uh, that can help a lot, and that's a very specific species uh, are involved in that. But really, you're talking about a couple hundred feet, you know, 30, 40 meters, maybe uh, tends to be the maximum that you'll see a seed go, uh, except under you know really really strong wind or some extraordinary mm -hmm. event. So if you're burning areas that are 15, 10 kilometers across where there's very little let, you know, living germplasm left, where's your recovery gonna come from? Yeah. So what happens is the ecosystem goes into a transformation, right? It gets taken over typically by shrub species, which also compete very strongly with the tree seedlings when and if they actually get on site. And the thing about the shrub systems in, in, in California and in a lot of the West is they're very flammable, particularly late season. So once you burn a forest out of this, of this kind of this yellow pine mixed conifer sort of ecosystem, uh, you're very, even if it site doesn't burn again in the near future, you're probably looking at 30 to 50 to 60 years before you start to see any tree cover on the site again. And of course, uh, you know, a century before you're gonna see a forest that looks anything like what you were looking at before it burned. I mean, that's what you're locked into if you don't reforest. So, uh, you know, that's really the big, question now is, uh, you know, where should we be doing reforestation? How much of it should we be doing? Can we afford it? Are the economic links there uh, to be able to pull it off? The scalar issues are just unbelievable. I and mean, when you think about the size of the U.S., the size of the fire problem, the area that we're losing in, in an average year to this kind of really severe fire, and the, the just chronic under budgeting for restoration and reforestation and they're 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 it's um they're, it's a challenge so like politics aside and funding aside if we could sort of sprinkle the magic fairy dust and you get what you want what would be an ideal management regime for this yellow pine ecosystem that you're describing and what would be any kind of knock-on benefits for whether it be climate change or biodiversity recovery or for people you know what what you know how would you manage it in an ideal world and what would be the spin-offs well, yeah, I, I mean, the ideal case is a hard one to talk about anymore, Nick, because the, with the climate changing like it is and with human populations going like they do and with, you know, whatever, you name it, whatever trend, it's all going in the wrong direction. Yeah, um, It's hard to talk about ideal situations because I think that we have to get serious about adapting to, you know, new normals. But the problem is that the new normals aren't static, that they themselves are changing over time. So it's a moving target. It's <laughs> really difficult. Uh, up till about 20, 30 years ago, we convinced ourselves that it was okay simply to use ancient conditions as a template for what we should be doing, where we should be going. Uh, and, and they're still valuable. It's important to know where an ecosystem was or where you were, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because you can't recognize trend unless you mm -hmm. recognize where you started. And also, if we can better understand how uh, forests, uh, you know, and ecosystems in general function before human degradation began to happen, then we understand thing, better things about the internal workings, you know, how species interacted and how biological and ecological, geological processes worked, right? Things like that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, with that preamble, I mean, probably the, 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 the biggest issue and the one that creates a lot of controversy, um, particularly in the conservation uh, uh, community, is that, you know, de the degradation that we're looking at is severe enough on a lot of the landscape. Um, that it's really going to require some pretty heavy intervention. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people don't like that. You know, I mean, the idea of uh, there's a, a healthy component of uh, American citizens who hate the idea of chainsaws in the forest and don't want anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. Yet by the same token, there are tens of millions of Americans living in highly risky situations uh, in which uh, if we don't reduce fuels, we're going to lose even more people. I mean, just you think about California, we, 10, 10 years ago, it was normal to maybe lose four or 500 homes a year to fire. Over the last five years, we've lost an average of 5,000 homes a year to fire and killing dozens of people now in an average year as well. So it's gotten to a point where we really have to do something, but that's not ecosystem restoration I'm talking about. I'm talking about just protecting infrastructure and people's lives. Mm. So almost all the work that we've done, Nick, to this point has been focused on, you know, sort of donuts around, uh, you know, uh, values at risk, we'll call them. Right. And so, OK, so we've gotten a handle on a lot of that. And, and we can clearly demonstrate that we are saving lives and saving homes and, and 
some cases, keeping forests in decent condition, even when they burn under super conditions. But the question is, how do you catch up with, you know, 100 years of missed fire? And how do you do this all at a, uh, at a velocity and at a, at a scale that it's going to make a difference? Uh, and that's really the, one of the basic questions about human ability to adapt to, to climate change um, in a progressive way in general, right? How do you make, how do you get governments to operate such that they're, they're managing based on hypotheses of change rather than actually things that they're, you know, they can see the change, but where it's going, who knows? So ideally, I think the big issue is, is how, how do you scale this stuff up? And um, w- one of the things that we know in, in California and a lot of the West is that a lot of the landscape can't be managed directly by humans uh, in the sense of like chainsaws, timber markets, biomass markets, you know, moving material off the, off the, out of the forest. Um, Because one, the timber market on federal lands in the Western U S has essentially collapsed. It doesn't, doesn't really exist much anymore. The, um, for example, the forest service supplied about 30% of the U S timber market back in the seventies and and eighties. Now it's about 5%. And the number of mills, of sawmills that can actually process timber that might come out of forest during forest thinning operations has collapsed. And they're mostly privately owned and they're mostly serving landscapes managed by the owners. And so it's kind of like the Forest Service gets lucky if there's any room in the mill at all for them to process anything. And the way that things work in the U.S., like they do in a lot of the Western world, is there has to be an economic outcome somewhere for somebody or work doesn't get done. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so all of this is done by, almost all of it's done by by private contractors, right? And if they're not making a profit, the work's not going to get done. And so uh, either there has to be a, you know, some level of economic output, i.e. saw timber, structural timber, uh, biomass for high efficiency, you know, for energy burning, uh, burning for energy, for example, bioenergy plants, uh, which we used to have quite a few in California, but you know, fossil fuels are incredibly cheap. It's ridiculous how cheap they are cur- even now. Uh, mm-hmm. And wind and solar obviously have made uh, inroads. And so now biomass energy really requires subsidy to be able to even be competitive mm-hmm. and, you know, things like that. Um, so there's a big economic issue. There's a huge economic gap. And like, what do we do with this material? We've lost the ability socially to deal with it. And, and you know, there's the rural collapse of rural economies as well, right? A lot of rural economies in the world depend on some level of extraction of natural resource from some ecosystem. And for better or for worse, that's, that's the truth. And so rural economies are tied to these things. Uh, energy security is tied to it. You know, a lot of yeah. high efficiency yeah. biomass burning these days can, can wean you from fossil fuel use. And it's theoretically, you know, at least at some level, it's a, it's a renewable resource, right? Because you can grow the forest back. Uh, and it's always going to be growing fuels that we need to remove. So there are parts of the landscape where that kind of work is can be carried out. There are, there are a lot of things that have to happen. Uh, I think California has made forward steps, uh, steps uh, more rapidly uh, in that direction than probably anywhere else in the U.S., largely due to the existence of the carbon cap and trade market, right, which actually provides a lot of money uh, to help manage forests. But even if you could conduct, you know, fuel reduction, forest thinning, and controlled fire, you know, under, under controlled conditions, we call that prescribed fire. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the amount of the landscape you can treat is, it's still pretty minimal because you've got large areas of wilderness where you can't do this work. You have large areas of forest that are forest land that's too steep mm-hmm. to be able to employ, me- you know, mechanized equipment. Mm-hmm. You have a lot of the landscape that's too far from the road network to do that either. And so there have been some fascinating studies done um, recently in California, looking at, you know, the scale of the issue and what really needs to be done. And all of that needs to be done. You know, there had the, that sort of what we call wild and urban interface work is being done already. Uh, expansion to, uh, you know, landscapes, sort of that buffer uh, inhabited areas that would need to involve human actions, cutting, removing, burning, chipping, masticating, sending stuff to biomass plants, et cetera. Mm-hmm. That's, happening but not nearly at a scale that it needs to happen but the other part of it is is that most of the rest of the landscape the only thing you can really do is begin to let naturally ignited fires burn again mm. and so we've done that there are parts of the landscape where that happens like a good portion of yosemite national park a large portions a large portion of sequoia and kings canyon national parks for example a lot of parks in the southwestern u.s as well um allow naturally ignited fires to burn very often and they've 
found all sorts of ecosystem benefits from it. It generates smoke, it scares people. Forest Service also, uh, we don't, the National Park System manages the National Parks, Forest, Forest Service manages lands often that surround the park. And we have a lot more competing uses in the landscape, so it's a little more difficult for us to do that. But it seems really clear that our focus on putting every fire out at all times is it's got to end. Mm-hmm. And it needs to end soon. Uh, and it's been, you know, already 40, 50 years ago, we recognized the problem. But, you know, the politics and the, and the risk aversion and all these kinds of things have made it very difficult to pull it off. But really, if you look at the numbers, there's no way that we get fuels reduced to most of the landscape unless fire begins to exercise its historical role as a major ecosystem process. And then, sorry, this is a long answer, but you also asked me about ecosystem benefits. And I mean, forests provide all sorts of ecosystem services. I mean, we could go on for hours talking about them, Um, but you know, any any ecosystem is gonna provide some of those services, but those are questions that society basically has to pose and answer, you know. What services do we really need? Which ones do we really want? What are we willing to give up to get them? You know, those sorts of things. And so, you know, obviously there's, uh, in the U.S., this isn't as as important as it used to be. In some societies, it still is. And that's just basic wood provision. I mean, really, we get most of our wood from plantations in the Southeast or from British Columbia, you know, in in, in Canada, really, and some from the Northwest. Um, There's very little in the way of a locally generated timber market anymore. so, you know, it's globalization, right? So that's a, that's a big issue, but there's one, there, there, are, there are commodities, right? That you extract and there's a lot of different things. Hunting, people hunt in, in, in forests. There are foodstuffs still that are collected, mushrooms and berries and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, that's much more important in, in, in places like in North Africa or in small villages in Turkey or Syria or wherever, you know, where people are really literally using the forest directly for livelihood. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously there are all sorts of, um, you know, the, car- the carbon sequestration uh, stuff is important. And a lot of it's in the soil and not actually in the wood. You know, forest soils are a major part of the terrestrial carbon sink. And um, so uh, that's an important one. Uh, obviously, there are recreational amenities. There are all sorts of uh, social and psychological amenities that are associated with it. recreational amenities. And a lot of that is a tourism is a huge part of the income for a lot of communities now and a lot of Western mountain ranges whether it be skiing or hiking or fishing or boating or hunting or whatever. And, and all of those are abetted best by a, you know, a functioning forest system. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, all of that stuff is, all of that stuff is benefited through some level of forest restoration or, 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 or progressive forest management. We'd rather not restore stuff if we can help it. It would be better simply to, you know, to, to, uh, to take a system that hasn't been too degraded and, and just sort of allow it to, to fall back into a more natural process of, 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 of fire cycles and water cycles and soil creation cycles and all the kinds of things. But that's, that's more and more difficult. Over time. Yeah. Almost something that we call like wilding or rewilding, I guess this side. Yeah, of the- yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I'm, I'm interested in you and your role as well. I mean, you're obviously working on some really big, challenging issues and have been doing for a number of years as in your role as regional ecologist at the U.S. Forest Service. Um, for people who are listening who don't know much about the U.S. Forest Service, could you just give us a bit of a description as to, you know, what it is and what it seeks to achieve? Like, what, what is your employer? Yeah, sure. So the Forest Service is part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, mm-hmm. and it's um, it's one of the largest land management agencies in the in the US government we manage about 80 million hectares close to 200 million acres right and that's about 30% of all uh, federal lands <laughs> in the US there are forgive me i forget the exact number but between 150 and 160 what we call national forests in the United States and those are you know, administrative units that tend to be around probably on average about 400,000 hectares or about a million acres something like that and in the Pacific Southwest region, which is where I work, we manage about 20 million acres or 8 million hectares, and there are 18 national forests. Wow. And the Forest wow. Service also includes the world's largest forest uh, research organization. Basically, um, and I'll read this to you, I have this written down what our mission is, it's to sustain the health, diversity, and productivity of the nation's forests and grasslands and meet the needs of present and future generations. So, you know, it's all about providing uh, everything to everyone at all times. <laughs> Easy peasy, right? You're going right? to be a big challenge, right? For anybody <laughs> to realize that you have to do everything for everybody at all times on, on all acres. 
Um, but anyway, so the Forest Service has four, four major branches. I work for what's called the National Forest System, which is probably what most people think of the Forest Service as people in the green outfits who are you know, working at a range of different actually out on the land. But we have a, an important research station, as I noted. Um, there's uh, fire management and state and private forestry, which kind of deals with you know, interactions with state and, pri and, and private individuals uh, and with fire uh, issues. And then we have an international program office. And then, you know, we have a bunch of different regions around the country. So I can tell you, so within the Forest Service, um, there are, it's not really that big an agency. When you consider that we manage 30% of all federal lands in the U.S. and manage at a territory that's larger than most countries on Earth, or many countries on Earth, um, we only have 30,000 employees, right. which is the same number of employees at Chicago O'Hare International Airport. <laughs> so, <laughs> was in I mean, it was in a meeting where someone was trying to tell someone that the Forest Service was a huge, unwieldy organization. I said to remind him, look, wait a minute, there are airports that have more employees than we've got across the whole country. But um, so I actually manage a very unique organization within the Forest Service. It's called the Region 5 Ecology Program. And it's a consortium of ecologists uh, that work. I, I manage the program, and there are 10 of them stationed around our region, which, like I said, is, is uh, largely California. And we're what we call a boundary spanning organization. And so what our job is, and by boundary spanning, we mean that we're sitting at the frontier of science and management, right? Basically, the staff is, they're scientists, but they actually work for the management arm of the Forest Service. So in other words, even though we're scientists, we don't work for the research organization, we work, we work for the management organization. And our job is uh, science delivery, right? Science delivery and translation. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is the best available science? What does science say now? Uh, what does the weight of evidence suggest that we ought to do? So we're advisors. And there's a power, it's a powerful place to be although you can always be ignored. <laughs> and that happens a lot of people spouting science, as you know. But um, the, uh, we, in that we don't work in the research branch, we're not like hermetically sealed off from the other part of the agency. We're actually part of it. And so, you know, our kids mm -hmm. played baseball and soccer with, uh, you know, the people who are out there, the kids and the people who are out doing the burning and the cutting and our offices are right down the door or down the hall and we have lunch together with, you know, so it's, we're not like somebody that you don't understand and whose language you barely speak, who you're like communicating with by email. Uh, rather, we're the people down the hall. And so we provide support to everything. I mean, we do a lot of the inventory and monitoring that happens on the forest. We provide support to planning efforts, like putting together strategies, very often involved in legal affairs, you know, providing declarations and depositions of lawsuits and objections to things, stuff like that. So, yeah, I, so it's, I, all of us really love it. Uh, it it's great work and um, it's feel good work. Although uh, like a lot of uh, sort of boundary spanning type kinds of jobs, like for example, you know, classic boundary spanning positions are teachers and, um, you know, priests. <laughs> and her, priest is standing <laughs> between God and earth. And, um, you know, it's a tough place to be because a lot of people who are on one side of the boundary think that you're not really one of them, you're part of the other side of the boundary. And then the other side of the boundary always wonders why you're interacting so much with that other side of the boundary. And so you're getting pulled in all directions at the same time. And the problems are so large and so wicked. You know, I don't know, you know, the concept of a wicked problem, right? I mean, the, the idea that you've got this problem that's basically unsolvable and that it morphs constantly and it has huge economic and social um, implications for everyone involved. And there are certain players in it who stand to gain a lot if it doesn't change and you know those kinds of things but you know it's a problem but anytime you fix one part of the problem you exacerbate the other part of the problem that's a, that's that's what you know that's where we are in ecosystem management and and so my staff and i are kind of right in the middle of all this and we're not decision makers so the one thing that we've had to become uh used to nick is the fact that we uh ideally Ideally, we are asked to provide our input because a management decision is going to be made on, you know, whatever, next Monday. Uh, and so we provide the input uh, with the proper uh, consideration of um, confidence. You know, actually, we don't know a whole lot about this. We know a lot about this. Pretty confident this is going to happen. I bet you this happens, but, you know, whatever. If I lose, I'll buy you beer. Whereas, you know, scientists very often get to just walk away from a situation like that. Like someone says, well, you know, 
budgets are running out and we got to allocate this money Monday and it's going to this or going to that. What do you think? And the standard science answer is like, oh, no, you give me some of that money. Maybe in five to 10 years of more work, I might be able to like feel good about telling you what to do. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's the way it works. You have to tell them that if you don't know, say it. Don't admit, you just say, I don't know this. We don't know this, but you don't get to say, we don't know it, therefore I can't inform you. What we say is, there's a lot that we don't know, but based on first and second principles and my understanding of X, Y, and Z, I'm going to tell you, this is what I think. However, this is real evidence for it. So we get involved in a lot of that kind of stuff as well. But I can tell you that all the people working in my staff, I've hired all of them uh, at this point. When I first came in, there was a there were there it was a smaller staff in those days, and all those people uh, retired and moved on. And not a single person that I've hired in the last twenty years has ever left their job. Wow. So uh, it's it's a it's a sign of great job satisfaction. Uh, um, you feel like you're really saving the world, or at least you're trying to, and it feels good. And we love working for the Forest Service. It's a it's an organization that's got, like I said, it's uh, somewhat schizophrenic because it's uh, you know uh, mandated to manage for everything everywhere. Um, but, uh, it's not just green in color. I think it's very green in soul, really. And, you know, every agency in a, every federal agency working for any government in the planet invariably gets used as a political tool at times. Mm. Uh, and you can't let that get in the way of what, you know, what, what, what we're doing, which is we're really trying to save the world <laughs> like most people in conservation. Right. So yeah. it's, it, it, keeps us up at, at night and I have nightmares all the time about things going horribly awry and, uh, but we're trying. <laughs> Still ahead. And that's the biggest wicked problem of all, like just trying to save the planet. I'm interested, right. you talked about like hiring people, you know, people staying for a long period of time, being sticky and being happy in their career. And it's lovely hearing about people being happy as well and how much you enjoy your role. Mm -hmm. When you're sort of hiring people and you're looking to bring new people in, like what, what are you looking for? What are the kind of character traits, the attributes, maybe even the skills that you kind of seek to, you know, recruit upon and, and, you know, and, and who stands out from the bunch, you know, you know, what, what is it that kind of gives those people the, the, the slight edge? Yeah, that's a great question. Like I said, I mean, we are what we call uh, boundary spanners. Now <laughs> I know that you're a priest and a teacher, right? Yeah. 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 Well, I, and also I should just for translation say, I mean, that's what, in the U.S., we're referring to that as sort of the spanning that a bridge does over a river rather than being a spanner. Like, yeah, you'd call what we call a yeah. wrench, a spanner in the U.K. And that's like a lot of people are like, wait a minute, it means you throw wrenches into things. I was like, no, that's exactly not what we do. <laughs> so, and anyway. You bridge um, the gap. Yeah, yeah we're, we're gap bridgers, as it were. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, you know, there are certain skill sets for people like that. And like I said before, I mean, it sounds kind of silly, but it's kind of the same skill sets that you'd look for in selfless teachers in inner city schools or in, you know, the missionaries being dropped into the middle, whether you're in favor of, you know, proselytization or not. I mean, that sort of general idea of having to work with little, but creating a lot out of a little, that's real right. resilience, <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. Good. That's, that's a good one. Your resilience. Uh, so, you know, obviously, I, I, the, the basic level is that, um, you know, the Forest Service, like any agency, has some very specific uh, guidelines they've set out as to, you know, what the minimum qualifications are for job series, you know, X number, you know, four or whatever. And so those exist and they're almost meaningless because they don't really cover most of the things that I really care about. But, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about natural resource tech professionals with a background in ecology, which invariably means that they've, you know, they've had your standard science, chemistry, you know, math, chemistry, physics kind of background. They've got stuff like that. But really for me, I'm, I'm looking to hire ecologists, not just natural resource professionals. So understanding the basic theories behind ecology, you know, what it's about, um, ecosystem function, uh, you know, coursework in, 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 in ecological processes. And, you know, ecology is basically the study of you know, you know, kind of deals with the relationships of organisms and, and the organ between organisms and their environment. And, but it deals with, it's like the economics of the natural world, right? So mm -hmm. it's a complex thing. And so we're not really just looking for someone who knows a lot about botany or a lot about wildlife, you know, but rather how they interact with their environment and everything else around. Mm -hmm. um, but I, th I would say that you, you earlier brought up that resilience, uh, the word resilience. Well, that's really important. So what really impresses me like, ideally, I get somebody, I don't know, you know, the Peace Corps is, the U.S. Peace mm -hmm, Corps. Yeah. yeah. So the so the, the Peace Corps is uh, an organization of, and 
most advanced nations have got something that's similar where, you know, usually younger individuals, not necessarily younger, but, you know, uh, decide that they want to go out and dedicate two to four years of their life in some difficult part of the world and helping local people or local problems um, with some can-do attitude and maybe a little, uh, you know, developed world uh, uh, thinking or technology or whatever. And yeah, people who've been in the, in the Peace Corps, for example, I, I just, boy, right away, they float to the top for me because I, they're the kind of people I know that you can drop in the middle of a, just a massive problem and just leave them and just say, okay, well, this is what I need you to get done and good luck. Okay, we'll see you in two years. You know what I mean? And and then they come out of that and someone who can, you know, and then there are obviously there are other people who've been in the military sometimes have similar skills depending on, although that military is much more of a hierarchical kind of thing where people tell you what to do. Peace Corps, you <laughs> get a whole lot of sides except, you know, go out there, do good work and come back and make us all proud. And um, so I, those kind of people float to the top for me. Uh, but people have a lot of life experience. You know, I love it. People who've traveled overseas who speak some foreign languages uh, because they, to me, uh, exemplify people who aren't afraid of going into novel situations and, and you know, making ends meet that way as well. Um, but good people skills is a really important one. We have to collaborate with everybody. I mean, there's so few of us, 10 of us in, you know, 8 million hectares. Um, and with, I don't even know what are there, how many ranger, probably 50 ranger districts in the state. And so there are hundreds of projects going on across the state at any given time. And we can only put our fingers on a small number of those things. Mm-hmm. So yeah. being able also to prioritize, you know, to understand, um, you know, really where are the real issues, putting your pulse on the problems of like, yeah, okay, I got a lot of issues, but this is the one where if I actually get engaged, I can make a real Money for fundraising. I hire people who've got some experience raising money because our budgets are always way less than what we need to pull off what we're what we're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. But you know, with the collaborations, you you can expand networks, make it more likely things are going to happen. Uh, you can by you know raising money across agencies, uh, you can pull off things that you can't do internally a lot of times. So those kinds of you know networking skills, fundraising skills, uh, are they good? Are, are they um, good communicators? You know, that kind of stuff is also really important. So we're talking about really solid scientists, also writing skills. I, I don't I don't I don't hire people who haven't published stuff because mm-hmm. just you have to be able to communicate what you're doing. Uh, and if you can't do it efficiently, effectively, then, you know, you're I. So this is one thing I will say that that was as I came into the agency, I was just working as a soft money researcher in the University of California system. So I was a scientist. Right. And in science work, you're usually running after a problem. You're a question asker and a problem solver, right? That's what it is. And then you report how you solve the problem and you drop it and move on to, you know, next project, which might be related or might not be. And you're very rarely asked to opine or, or a, a how about how what you did is actually going to make a difference. I mean, literally, like what, did, what you just did, how does that solve this problem? And tell us how we're going to do this. And advise us. And scientists rarely get involved in, in that side of the work. It's kind of called loading dock science, right? Where you just dump off your box on the dock and head back into the store and someone's going to come and pick it up. But most of the time, they don't even know how to use it. It's like giving someone a car without the keys hmm. or giving someone a car and no one in the whole town knows how to fix an engine or, or anything. And I mean, you know, you're done. At some point, it's going to, no one's going to be able to use the thing anymore. And so we, you know, we can't, we can't do that. And so uh, sort of long-term engagement, ability to stay engaged in processes and to create tools that managers help you design so that they, they actually design the format, you know, and the workings and they understand, and then you understand on your part, why it is you're doing what you're doing, what problem it is solving, and that they always have you to go to down the hallway if they need to, you know, modify the thing or they have feedback on it or it broke, you know what I mean? So that's a, one of the other differences between the scientists and my staff and the standard scientists. We're in it for the long haul in terms of, you know, applying this to, to management, to apply management issues. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just science for science sake, but it's actually been implemented and applied and you're advising how to do that. Right. Do you? Yeah. Um, yeah. No, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Do you, um, do you offer opportunities for people to come in and get experience or work within the forest service? If there are people listening, say I'd love an internship or something like that. Are those yeah. opportunities available? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, things get in the way sometimes like COVID was <laughs> kind of a pain in the butt. <laughs> Still is. I'm sorry. I, that's a understatement of the year. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. That was actually a bad way to put that. I'm not meaning to make light of it, no. but um, 
that now we're starting again. It's like, okay, we're, what, what do we do again? What have we been doing for the last 15 months? Oh, okay. All right. So I, I have, I host a lot of interns actually, and not just American interns, but international interns. In fact, I've had, uh, I had an intern from the UK uh, a couple of years ago from England, uh, from the University of Cumbria. She was awesome and worked for me for five months. And then I had another one lined up to come this summer, but you know, COVID shot that down. Right. Um, over the last few years, I've had Spanish, I've had Germans, I've had some from Georgia, someone from the Ukraine worked with me for a while. I have, I've had people from Brazil and Mexico in my lab, Turkey, you know. So I'm really in. Oops, I've got a bit of feedback there, sorry. Do people tend to um, connect to you personally and see what's available or do you advertise them? Is it a, a particular program? Like how can people, you know, engage yeah, oh. in this? Yeah, bo both. Yeah, absolutely both. You know, I mean, you know, word of mouth always is that's the way the world works, even in the modern age, obviously. So someone who's been with you had a positive experience and the word gets out. Um, so I've done that. And then also uh, I've worked a lot with a, well, a couple different programs. The one I'll, I'll highlight is this thing called uh, Forestry. Uh, International Forestry Fellows, I think is what it's called. Uh, although, again, 15 months of COVID is I've forgotten everything at this point. <laughs> because uh, everything's uh, shut down we'll find it put a link in yeah uh, yeah anyway but it's it's run through the u.s forest service and they have agreements with the top uh forestry schools in europe on um, on the continent mind you i don't think actually in the uk there at the time that i was working with them they didn't have any connections my connections with university of Cumbria were personally i guess both my staff um but they but but they've expanded now to other universities that are have forestry staff in develop in the developing world and in eastern europe as well um, so, uh, what it does is it works with, uh, it identifies opportunities in the United States, in the U S forest service, like where there are districts or, um, national forest units that, you know, would like to have an intern could use an intern. And then they identify people with the correct level of skill. You know, typically these are advanced, uh, undergraduate or, or, you know, maybe master's level students or some cases, PhD students are just looking to spend four to six months overseas. A lot of cases they have to. Right. In a lot of these schools, there's some level of a practicum that you have to do somewhere yep. and they can do it in the U.S. And it's kind of cool. And we like it because it's always fun having people with different opinions, different ideas who come from different parts of the world. Um, and it's fun. And uh, also they uh, I hate to be so uh, mercenary about it, but they're cheap. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just, I, I remember I did internships when I grew up, you, know, you didn't make a whole lot of money, but they kept you alive. And so essentially your costs are cut. You're given a stipend every month and I have to find housing is what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ideally they're earning course credit or something for it as well, depending on what the setup is. But, um, you know, there's a lot of different stuff that we can get involved in. Typically it involves a lot of work in the field. Basically, we've got them out and they're camping a lot. They're traveling around the Western U.S. a lot. They're seeing a lot of the U.S. And they're climbing up mountains and they're getting really fit. And they're, you know, stepping on rattlesnakes and losing food to bears and all sorts of really interesting. Oh, good to that point. Yeah. So for anyone looking for some adventure, but a, a great educational experience. And, you know, there's great methodological training. And we try to, if they're interested, we get them involved in in. In, in the output sides of the science as well, like in data entry, data analysis. In some cases, we've had some of the interns involved in write-up and even publication or something. Like that. So I, there's, and I'm not the only person doing this. There are a lot of people in the Forest Service who are involved in this uh, International Forestry Fellows thing, or just in internships generally. So abs absolutely. So there are, the short answer is, yeah, there are opportunities. And my staff and I are really excited always to work with, with uh, smart young people. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. Well, well, we'll find stuff and we'll put links in the show notes as well. So people can kind of dig yeah. up and find out a little bit more. And that I think comes to a nice kind of conclusion really with our time together. And I'm aware you've got things to go on to after this call as well. So I just want to thank you, Hugh, for kind of sharing your time and your advice with us on the show. It's been a real pleasure talking to you, hearing more about your work, the huge kind of challenges and issues that you're kind of seeking to tackle and, and the enjoyment that you're obviously getting out of your career and the passion you have for your subject. So it's a real kind of pleasure talking to you. People want to find out a bit more about you or your work. Is there any way you particularly like us to point them? Yeah. So you can send them, send them to my, so I, uh, I work for the forest service. They pay my salary, but I'm also an adjunct professor at university of California, uh, the Davis campus. And you can send them to my website there. That would be the best place to go. Our forest service websites are getting a little bit aged, um, but I think that would be the best place to go. They'll have my contact information, information about what we're doing links to 
studies that we're involved in currently and some of our focus efforts. And my UC Davis lab is to an extent like an adjunct of my Forest Service staff. We work very, very closely together. And um, I have a lot of postdocs and students and lab scientists there who work on Forest Service related business, but a lot of work overseas as well. It's a really fun group of people and we'd love to interact with more interested people worldwide. Great, great. Okay, well, we'll share that link as well as part of our show notes. Once again, Hugh, thank you so much for joining the show. You're welcome, Nick. It was a pleasure. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, everyone. If you did, then please do hit the subscribe button to get notified of new episodes as they drop. Um, And also, please give us a rating or a review because it really helps us to get in front of more people. Now, if you want our help to get clear and get started and get hired as a professional conservationist, I recommend you enroll in our free online training program, exploring how to get a conservation job. So if you're a student, a job seeker or a career switcher, you'll learn the golden rule about how to get started, the key mistakes to avoid, and also we'll answer your biggest questions. You can check that out at conservation hyphen careers.com forward slash free. See you soon.